welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Bill Lines. He is a urologist and he wrote the Kevin MD article, The Invisibility of Mental Illness. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Kevin. I really appreciate it. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Sure. I'm a, a physician, as you mentioned. I'm a urologist, as you mentioned. But what most people don't know about me is I'm a survivor of multiple suicide attempts. And uh, I guess I'll start off talking about when I went to medical school. I went to medical school in Galveston, Texas, UTMB, and got my medical degree. That was 1981. And then I did a urology internship and residency at Stanford University. That was 1981 until 1987. In 1987, I moved to Southern California and uh, with my wife and my family, and I started practicing uh, urology at uh, Southern California Kaiser Permanente Medical Group in Riverside, California, which is in Southern California. And what I would like to talk about is the period of time that I practiced medicine. I can divide that period of time, which would be 1987 until 2003 into two distinct eras. The first era being an era where I had a really happy, busy, successful urologic practice and, and private life. But in 1998, something happened to me, uh, which I'll mention in a moment. And I began what I call a downward spiral into darkness, which is sort of code for suicidal behavior, call it also my demise. So what happened to me in 1998 was that I went on a uh, vacation outside of the country. When I came back, didn't feel well, and eventually I woke up one night with shaking chills and fever. I ended up being intubated in the Kaiser intensive care unit within around two hours, literally and uh, for septic shock and respiratory failure. I was in the intensive care unit for six weeks. I was I had a tracheostomy, I uh, lost 40 pounds. I had all the manifestations of sepsis with DIC and, and ARDS and so mm -hmm. forth. Somehow I survived, I rehabbed and I went back to work. But what happened to me is about a year and a half later, I had a snowboarding accident again on a vacation. And I sustained multiple facial fractures, and I had to have five facial operations. I was in the ICU again. I lost 40 pounds again. I had a tracheostomy again, and somehow I survived this and uh, was able to go back to work two months later. Mm -hmm. But when I went back to work, Kevin, things were just not the same for me mentally. I, I suffered, just to put it in easy terms, in terms of depression, severe depression. It was, uh, it was a black depression, worse than I'd ever had before. It was day after day. It was grim. And there seemed to be nothing I could do to help myself. I started seeing psychiatry at that time, and they feel that I have bipolar 2 affective mood disorder. And I was introduced to the wonderful world of antidepressants and mood stabilizer therapies. And I also had electroshock therapy. I had had over 30 uh, treatments with uh, electroshock therapy. So, but, but when I would go to back to work, I just was not the same. Mm -hmm. Excitement was gone. I, I had trouble getting to work. I had trouble in the operating room. At least I, I perceived that I did. And I decided to try to kill myself. And so I, I tried uh, suicide on three occasions, the last being 2003, when I retired from medicine. I decided at that time that in order to save my life, I would have to leave the practice of medicine. And then if you fast forward into 2017, I wrote an article that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine called The Last Day. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a treatise, a, an essay, which chronicled my last day of medical practice and that suicide. And I had tremendous improvement that and with continuing to be an advocate and a speaker, a tremendous improvement in my mental outlook 
and in the way I felt about myself. And so I've been an advocate for physician burnout and suicide since that time, uh, doing various speaking and writing jobs. And so I, that's sort of my story. That's basically my story. And you go more into that in your Kevin MD article, it's titled The Invisibility of Mental Illness. Now, for yes. those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the yeah. story of why I decided to share it? Yes. I, I wrote that article in 2007, actually, and it just sort of percolated around. And the, the premise of the article is that the, the, the treatment, the follow-up, the from the patient's standpoint as well, there are no hard signs associated with medical mental illnesses. There are symptoms, which are things that patients tell you, but there are no signs, which are things that you you measure. You know, if, if you have a uh, upper respiratory tract infection and you have a fever, it sort of confirms that you're sick. Mm -hmm. But in the case of mental illness, there really isn't anything like that. People have a hard time appreciating what depression is and, and what, what degree you have that to. So I, I, I just put that into, into the idea that it's, it's, it's sort of invisible. It's, it's invisible to the observer and it's, it's really observable, invisible to the patient. It, it introduces us some some difficulties. It from from the observer physician standpoint, they don't have corroborating pieces of information that I, I feel that you have bipolar disease. I'm going to get a lab test. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen. It's it's a it's a subjective type of measurement that that goes on. So there's some difficulty with that. But especially from the patient standpoint, I always got the feeling that people thought I was faking. You you can't really be that depressed. And and if I if I had been able to turn to well yeah my GHR level is is sixty five and that proves that 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 would have taken some of the burden off of me. But but unfortunately we don't we don't have that. So that's sort of the premise of of the article. Now when you said that some people thought that you were faking your symptoms. Are we talking about people at at your workplace? Well, yeah, I, I mean, nobody ever said, I think you're faking, uh, but I often had, I, I felt a tremendous amount of guilt about being ill, mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were certain people who I, I, I accepted me and then other people who, who did not. And so, yeah, yeah. The, primarily in my case, it was, you know, in terms of my work environment. Now, when you were still practicing, how much did the medicine itself contribute to some of the behavioral health issues that you described? No question. Yeah, no question. I had a long, long career of what I call the culture of overwork. And so trying to juggle my medical practice with my family life all led to, you know, sort of a classic burnout, you know, <clears throat> situation. And, it, you know, if, if I had had a situation where I, I could have taken an administrative job that might have helped, but, but I didn't. So I just continued to practice urology. And, you know, I was really busy in my practice and uh, as most physicians are. And so, yes, it definitely did contribute to, to my downfall. And shortly before you stopped practicing, was there anyone who pulled you aside and said, Bill, I think you should take a break. I, I think you should see someone like did any of your, your colleagues or people that you work with notice any any of the warning signs well in in my case my first suicide attempt was was hidden from everybody my second suicide i took a massive overdose and i ended up in a locked psychiatric ward and sort of the bag it was out of the bag at that point mm -hmm. and i had to go in front of a hospital wellness committee and there were certainly many many people on that who said that you really shouldn't be practicing medicine so but i, I had a, a dear friend you know his his wife actually called me one night to talk to me about my depression and but beyond that i didn't i you know i, I blame myself i i really i really was very very hidden in hiding my psychopathology and once i had that massive overdose you know everybody knew uh, it and but not that many people came up to you know to share and to you know to to help me now if you were to start your medical journey 
all over again, let's say before you started practicing, what, what would you have done differently back then? I would realize that I have this tremendous ability to overwork uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I would be on the, the outlook for, for that all the time. I would try to balance my life between my family and my, my work in, in the office much, much better. One thing that really bothered me, this would be in the early 90s, is you remember laparoscopic surgery was coming in, especially to urology. And uh, the question is, when you're not in a training program, how do you learn that? Mm -hmm. And it really bothered me because I, I, I needed to do it and I did it. I never felt like I was properly trained uh, to do it. And so if I had taken a, uh, a sabbatical and, and learned the, the, some of the new advents in surgery, I would have, I would have been probably done a lot better. And then the last thing is, I think that I should have pursued some non-clinical administrative job. So those are some of the things that I think about. Now, when you say that you would have balanced your life a little bit better between medicine and family, what exactly would that have looked like? Would that be just fewer hours in the OR to clinic? Would that be taking that administrative job? In your mind, what would that have looked like? Probably, probably all of that. I, um, I worked very hard. I came home very late. I, I did those sort of things and, and, and many, many physicians do, do that well, do that as well. So I'm not alone here, but it seems to me that I could have been more efficient, more mindful to the fact that I needed to, to be off when I was off. And so, yeah, that, that's what I would say. We we're talking to Bill Lines. He is a urologist and he wrote the Kevin MD article, The Invisibility of Mental Illness. Bill, thank you so much for sharing your story. And as you said, a lot of physicians are in similar positions now that you were back then. Tell me what kind of warning signs they should be looking out for and what kind of advice that you have for these physicians who may be on the brink of burnout. I think that there is two major things that the burnout, if you will, physician can do. Uh, one, one is a seek mental health treatment, a psychiatry therapy, that sort of thing. Don't, don't be, don't be afraid to do that. I think if physicians are, I think they, they just don't want to talk to a psychiatrist. So studies have shown that that sort of treatment is beneficial in, in burnout and suicide risks. The second thing that I found, which was just a tremendous relief was to admit your problems in my case to the world. And, uh, it, it somehow just takes the burden off of you feeling embarrassed about it. If you, if you're not, if you're not embarrassed to admit uh, that, that you have a problem, it just takes the tremendous amount of, of, of burden off of you. So those are the two sort of take home messages that I would like to leave with uh, the audience. Now you've shared your story, of course, on Kevin MD and you've written articles in the annals of internal medicine. I'm sure plenty, a lot of physicians have, have heard your story in general. What are some of the responses that you receive after you share your story? 99.9% very, very good. Most of them, you're very brave. Thank you for doing that. I, I, I'm having trouble too. I, every time I speak, I get one or two people who contact me and one, one guy said he was crying as he was typing in an email to me. That's the kind of response. I, I did have one interesting response that, that I put in that negative category which is in, in, I believe in the last day I write, then I took a cowardly way out and tried to, you know, kill myself or something like that. And the person's point was that suicide shouldn't be thought of as a cowardly option. And I did not mean uh, that all people who attempt suicide are cowards by any means. I just meant that in my own case, as I look back, I feel somewhat cowardly. I had three children and a wife. And so that's the only negative I've got. The great, great majority have been very, very positive. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? 
Well, the, the main thing is that I found tremendous improvement in admitting my, my psychopathology and it is almost really, it's almost immediate relief. It, it makes you not afraid to have somebody know that you are having that, that sort of problem if you already can confront it. And the, the second thing is that restructuring your life for the physician and then seeking mental health care is important in the treatment of the burnout uh, possible suicidal physician. Bill, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you, Kevin.